Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go over for the Lord together in prayer. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful we get to come into your house, God. Lord, we give you the praise and glory and the honor for what you've already done in this church service. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Tonight, Lord, as we open your word, we pray that you open us up, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is the teacher tonight, God. Come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the discipline, even the correction that we need for our everyday lives. Sweet anointing of God, come and teach us. Be the teacher of the church, Lord. Our eyes look upon you, God, and we give you our attention, our interest, God. Lord, we thank you that you come right now, and you come and fill this place and speak to us. A now word for each and every one of our hearts, God. Even if I didn't say it, Lord, your spirit can speak it. May your will be done in this place tonight. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. No time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God, we ask that you bless our brothers and sisters, bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, God. We thank you for Calvary Chapel, for Harvest, God, for Oak Valley, for the well and the way, God. We thank you for Ecclesia and Trinity, God, and, and uh, Lord, all the, all the great churches, Emmanuel Baptist, God, Victory Outreach, Lord, for the Catholics, God, for the Adventists, God, and for the four square denominations, God, and the assemblies of God. Lord, if they're preaching your gospel and your truth, we bless them as you bless us this night. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. Tonight, get your Bibles. If you want somewhere to turn, Isaiah chapter 40 would be where we're going to start tonight. But really, uh, uh, tonight I want to talk to you more about a topic than anything else. That doesn't mean we're not going to be in the Word, by the way. You're going to need your Bible tonight. Tonight, the topic is where strength comes from, where strength comes from. Now, the simple answer, let me just give it to you, okay? The simple answer is that strength comes from God. That's, that's the easiest. In fact, one of the names of God is, is, oh, Lord, my strength, right? So God himself, one of his names is strength. And if you need strength, the easiest way to get a hold of strength is to ask God for it. God, please give me strength. And then you stand in faith, you believe, and you wait on the Lord. Let me show this to you in the scripture, okay? Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 31, says this. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, I want you to notice something about the type of strength that God gives. When you go to the Lord and you ask God for something, God is a good God and he gives good gifts to his children. If you ask him for bread, he won't give you a stone. If you ask him for an egg, he won't give you a serpent or a snake, right? And so here God is and he says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. That means you will soar in life. You will go higher than you could ever go on your own. See, the eagle, the eagle flies high. The eagle doesn't just fly high, it flies high in style. Hello, come on, somebody. Right? That is a majestic bird. I've seen crows trying to fly, you know, and they're like, bah! and it just doesn't look cool. But you see, the, you see the eagle rising up, and you almost stand in attention. You almost have to just stand in awe of what's going on. Why? Because it just lifts those massive wings and just rides the wind. See, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Now, I don't know when the last time you ran a mile was in this place. Come on, somebody. You try and run two steps out of your front door and you're already huffing and puffing, especially when it's 105 outside. My goodness. But see, when God gives, God doesn't just give a little bit. God doesn't just give a little dabble, do you? No, God gives you more than enough. Our God is an exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, God. So here God is, and you ask God for strength, and you wait on the Lord, you believe God, you rest in faith. What happens? You will mount up with wings like eagles. You shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. You're going to make it. God will give you the strength you need, not just to carry you to the finish line, but to carry you through onto the next assignment that God's given you. Are you listening today? Now, 
That's the God side of things. In every subject you could study, there's the God side of things and then there's the man side of things. We just talked about the God side of things. I, I could have preached a whole sermon just on that right there. Pray, believe, wait, you know, and we could have gone through all that. But I believe that that's kind of like the ABCs. That's the most basic level. You want strength, just ask God, believe God for it, and wait on the Lord. He'll give it to you. That's, that's the easy part. That's the God part, right? Now, the God side of things, God will take care of the God side of things. But the man side of things, God says, I want you to work in partnership with me. See, this is a marriage relationship. We are now bound to the Lord, and now we are partners with the Lord. We are working with, we are co-laborers with Christ, right? And now the man side of things, where does strength come from? See, if our strength comes from the Lord, then we need to work with the strength of God in us. And so tonight I'm going to put a statement up on the overhead. I'm going to complete it three times tonight. Working with the strength of God in. A couple of things tonight. They all start with the letter H. Why did I do that? So that you would remember it, okay? Because I need that stuff in my life too. I got to remember this. Working with the strength of God in. If we're going to do our side, if this is the man's side of things, God will do his part. We've asked. We believe God. Our faith is out there. God will pour out the strength on us. If we wait on him, God will bring it about in the right time and the right way. Now, how do we work with? The strength of God in our lives. Working with the strength of God in, number one, holiness. Number one thing, if we're going to work with the strength of God, we've got to work with the strength of God in holiness. Now, let me describe and define for you what holiness is. Holiness is being exclusive to the Lord. We talked about the marriage relationship between Christ and the church just a moment ago. Think about a marriage relationship here on the earth. A marriage relationship that is pure means that the husband is exclusive to the wife and the wife is exclusive to the husband. I've heard all this foolishness about open marriage and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole bunch of hooey. There is no such thing as open marriage. When you got married, you made a covenant to one person. You said yes to that person. And in saying yes to that one person, you just said no to everybody else. Are you listening? Okay? That's how that works. I know our society's trying to screw that up, and the devil's been after marriage all this time because it's a picture of Christ in the church, but that is the order of God. When you are married, you are exclusively your partners. Now, all that you have is theirs. All that they have is yours. You are not your own anymore. You are theirs, right? And, and now there is a union that comes together. In the same way, if we're going to work with the strength of God, we've got to work with that strength in holiness. I am exclusively God's. And God is exclusive to me in my personal relationship, if you understand what I'm talking about. Obviously, God is great enough and strong enough, most wonderful God there is, that he can be exclusively each and every one of ours all at the same time. I don't know how he does that, but he does it. In studying this out, I found a couple of scriptures. Last part of Ezekiel 7.13, you don't have to turn there, I'll just quote it for you, but it says this, No one will strengthen himself who lives in iniquity. Isn't that Interesting. No one will strengthen himself who lives in iniquity. In other words, we cannot expect the strength of God if we are not exclusively following him. If your heart is divided after other things, people, anything that can take the place of God, now then you are not going to be flowing with the strength of God. See, that'd be like expecting power from a disconnected device. You hear me? See, if you took a vacuum cleaner at your house and, and you kind of half plugged it in, you might get some power out of that, but you don't want to touch that plug. Why? It's unsafe. And, and as you are vacuuming, the moment that that vacuum goes beyond the length of what that cord can reach and it pops out of the wall, there is no more power anymore, right? It goes... Why? Because it's not connected. It is not completely hooked in, locked in. Now, we understand that in the natural, that there is one plug, and it goes in the one receptacle, and that moment you now have power. And yet, when we disconnect our hearts and lives with God, when we get divided attention, divided interest, and we're expecting the power of God, we, I, I almost picture God saying, what do you expect? You're disconnected. There's no power when you're disconnected. You've got to connect, you've got to hook up, and you've got to be exclusive. I want all of your focus. I want all of your attention. I want all of your interest. I want every faculty, every bit of who you are and what you are. All that you have on earth is wholly devoted to me. Why? Because God is an you know, egotist or a megalomaniac? No, because God knows 
how to get the power into our lives. A great example of this is Samson. Okay, now you guys remember the story. Here's Samson. He's a Nazarite. What does that mean? It means from the time he was a baby, his mom never let him drink any sort of strong drink, no wine, and they never cut his hair. Samson had seven braids on his head, right? I picture cornrows. Don't you picture that when you hear seven braids? I know we're in San Bernardino, but come on, work with me here. And so here's Samson, and, and, and you know, he was a mighty man. He went out, he killed hundreds of men with a jawbone of a donkey. I mean, my goodness. Uh, they, they thought they had him surrounded one time, and they had him locked in the city. And he goes and he lifts up the gates of the city. Now, when we hear the gates of the city, you know, we're thinking like the gate outside our house. That was not the gates of the city. In fact, the gates of the city probably would have been like one of these big arches right here and two massive wooden doors with a big thing block in the center of them. He lifts that thing up and puts one on each shoulder, right? And he walks it up to the hill and he sets it down outside the city. This guy was crazy. This guy did amazing feats of strength as well as judged Israel. He was the one who was ruling. He was the one that was keeping them safe from the enemy. And this guy had everything going for him with his strength and with his position, and yet morally his heart was divided. He had women from the Philistines. He had uh, one, one verse says that he saw a harlot and went into her. He slept with her. See, morally his heart was divided. It wasn't completely locked into God, and he allowed the, the, the love of women to get into his heart until he met a girl, you know her name, Delilah. And here Delilah is, and she gets, uh, you know, a, a request from the Philistine leaders, and they say, you know, well, we will pay you, and they, they give her this exorbitant amount of money if she'll find out the secret of his strength. Well, she didn't care. You know, he was just after her for her body, so she's just after him for money. So now here she is. She double-crosses him and starts to pester him. Hey, what's the source of your strength, Samson? Well, tell me what it is. And after she pesters him for a while, Samson lies to her and gives her a little something to get her off the, the scent, Right? Well, it doesn't work, and so she acts like she's heard about it, and so she continues on. Then he tells her, oh, weave my hair into a loom, you know, and bind me with seven new fresh bow strings. And I mean, every time, you know, bind me with brand new ropes that have never been used on anything, and, and it never works. He just snaps right through it each and every time until finally she pesters him and pesters him and pesters him and pesters him until the Bible says he is vexed unto death. He just wants to die like, woman, get off me. Just stop it, Right? Don't move. Don't move, husbands, okay? Don't you even look at your wife right now, okay? <laughs> Just right here, all right? And so here Samson is, and finally he says, God, okay, 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 okay. There's never been a razor used on my head. I'm a Nazarite. I took a vow. If you cut my hair, that'll be the end of my strength. So she lulls him to sleep on her lap. See, once again, she's using what she knows is his weakness, putting him in that position, lulls him to sleep, and then calls for somebody, they shave his hair. He gets up, and he thinks that the Lord's going to be with him again, and yet he has not lived a holy life, and you know what happens? They bind him, they pluck his eyes out, and then he goes, and he's in the prison in a grind. Now, the neat thing about the story is, is that God is a redemptive God, and God is a God who restores all things, and the Bible says that Samson's hair began to grow again. Now, that wasn't the source of his strength, okay, just to let you know. That was symbolic of the fact that God was bringing things back, that God is a restorer of all things. And so here he is in the grind, right, in the grind, the daily grind, the, the grind of each and every day there, and he's having to work, and the Philistines are having this celebration. There's thousands of them. A bunch of them are up on the roof. A bunch of them are inside the house of their, their idol, their god, lowercase g, Dagon, and, and, and so here they are, and they, they say, hey, bring in Samson, the champion. We want to laugh, and we're going to have him perform. And he's kind of like the court jester. He's the ridicule. He's the laughing stock. And Samson, as he goes in, he, he says uh, to the guy that's leading him in, because he's blind, remember, he says, put me by the supports that I can lean against them. And there he supports him, and he says, God, if you will one more time give me strength that I can take vengeance on the Philistine for my two eyes. He says, let me die with the Philistines. And his heart is devoted to God. He's holy once again. God grants his prayer, his request, and in his death, he slays more Philistines than he did in his life. But what was the difference of his life? Holiness. 
holiness, completely focusing on the Lord. You're there in Isaiah, turn me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, great little verse in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. And this is a grouping of verses, so if you want to read the, the whole group sometime from 27 through 29, we're just going to take a look at verse number 29. But all of it applies. Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 29 says this, The way of the Lord is strength for the upright. Stop right there. Did you catch that? The way of the Lord. See, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In the book of Isaiah, you will find there is a highway of holiness. And Jesus said that narrow is the way, and there are few who find it. Wide is the way that leads to destruction. See, so the way of the Lord is strength for the upright. Jesus is the new and living way. As we follow in his footsteps, what is that? A way of holiness where we are exclusively God's. It's going to provide strength for us. But destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. You cannot have a divided heart and expect strength from the Lord. Are you listening tonight? Amen? Or oh me? A little of both. Praise God. I'm in there with you, okay? Just so you know, I'm not preaching down on you because I, I got to live this too. I may be anointed to preach it, but I am no more anointed to live it than you are. We are all in this together. Working with the strength of God. This is the man's side of this. We ask God. God gives it to us as we wait on him and believe him for it. We work with the strength of God, number one, in holiness. Number two, I like this one. Number two, we work with the strength of God in humility. Humility. Remember I said all these are going to start with H. So holiness and humility. What is humility? Is that thinking less of yourself? Or thinking of yourself less? See, it really, humility, if you find out, it's really dependence on God. Where you recognize and you realize, I can't do this on my own. I need God. I'm not cool. I'm not smart. I, I, I'm not resourced. I'm not gifted. I, I'm not strong enough. God, I need you to come through. And you are now dependent on God for everything. That's what true humility is. Very familiar verses. In fact, Pastor Luke was in these verses a, a couple uh, weeks ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn there with me in the New Testament now. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. There's certain things that are worth saying again and again and again. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. The Apostle Paul is talking about his life, and you know what? He had a tall order on his life. The Apostle to the Gentiles, carrying the revelation of grace, preaching and teaching. And he's got this buffeting. What is buffeting? It means a continuous pounding, coming against him like the, like the waves of the sea against the, the, the seashore, just continuous again and again and again. He says, I went to one place, and here they are buffeting me. There was a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, just came at me again and again and again, and it was buffeting me, coming after me. And I prayed to the Lord, and I asked the Lord three times if he would remove it from me. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9 and verse number 10, this is the Lord's response. He asked him that it might depart, verse number 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, he told them, I'm not going to remove the buffeting. I'm not going to take that thing away from you. Why? Because my grace is sufficient for you. You can make it through the problem and the trial and the pain and the pressure. How? By the grace of God. For he says, for my strength, is made perfect in weakness. Well, now when the Apostle Paul heard this, he didn't start blubbering. <laughs> no, Lord, that's not what I asked. All I want you to do is take it away. He didn't start whining and complaining. I did that pretty good, right? I've got three small children at the, at the house. That's why I know I'm, I'm a master at this because I hear it all the time. Well, what does he do? Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. In other words, the opposite of humility is pride, right? So he says, rather than pride myself in my strength, my education, my ability, my lineage, who I am, in the book of Philippians, he says, I count all those things as dung. You know what dung is? Poo-poo. 
Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast, where? In my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, the Apostle Paul says, I can't make it. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not nice enough. I'm not eloquent enough. I don't have enough education. I don't have the right background. I didn't come from the right family. Verse number 10, look at this. Verse number 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. In other words, if you're doing it for Jesus and you're going through the problems for Jesus, then pride yourself in that. You know what? I can't do it. I'm not strong enough. In fact, I'm quite weak. I'm not smart enough. In fact, I'm quite dumb. I make the wrong decisions sometimes, and, and I don't always know what I'm doing. I don't have the plan. Uh, you know, people come against me, and they've tried to stop me. But it's all for Jesus' sake. Look at this. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's a, it's a paradox to our thinking. It doesn't make sense. It's a, almost an oxymoron when you think about it. And yet, God is saying something. God is saying, if you humble yourself and you lean yourself wholly on me, if you completely depend on me, that's when the power of God will be working in you. Humility. Humility. You know what? Another one of the things that's humbling for many of us, especially those of us who think that we are educated or smart or nice, is this one. The Bible says in Jude chapter 1, Jude, right there before the book of Revelation, you find Jude, verse number 20. If you want to turn there with me, go ahead. Second to last book in the Bible. If you hit Revelation, come around. Come back. If you hit the maps, you've gone way too far. Come on back. Jude Really, there's only one chapter, Jude. So find verse 20. Jude, verse 20, look at this. But you, beloved, building yourselves up, that's strengthening yourselves, is that right? Okay, so you're working together with the grace of God, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit. In other words, you could pray the right prayers. You could think that you were eloquent or smart. And you could go to God and you could tell God how to strengthen you and what to do and how to do it, right? Many times I know I have failed in my prayers because I have gone to God with my plan. I've gone to God with my five points. I've gone to God with my thing, right? And, and, and yet God says, no, that's not how it's going to happen. Man, I thought this time he would finally agree to it. And yet what does he say? You, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith praying in the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you're going to believe God for something in life, believe God for strength, you've got to pray in the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Because it goes beyond your understanding. You have to humble yourself and believe the incoherent babblings of what your mind doesn't understand is actually a language speaking to God. And so you have to pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, I came out of a very conservative background. I believed the Bible. I believed the Word of God was true. I believed all the gifts were for today, but I had never seen them in operation. And I started coming to this church, and this church was telling me something that I knew was to be true. I saw it in the Word. I agreed with it, but in practice, I was freaking out. <laughs> Anybody can identify with that, right? And I was thinking, you want me to what? You want me to pray in the Spirit? Okay. What do I say? No. You got to tap into the Spirit. How do I do that, right? Well, you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, how do I do that? Well, Jesus is the baptizer, right? And they lay hands, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now speak. I got nothing, right? I got one word. They said, speak the word. So I said the word. Do it again. So I did it again. Do it again. So I did it again. And I was kind of like sitting there thinking, guys, I don't think it works on me, you know? <laughs> and it was funny because I was talking to my wife at the time we were dating. And, uh, you know, this is a big deal to her. This was like make it or break it time. She's going, I can't not be with a guy who is not filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, praying in the Holy Spirit, right? Because he just doesn't have the power he needs to deal with me. No, that's not what she was saying. <laughs> She's not here tonight, so I can say, honey, if you're watching on the live stream, I love you. Mwah. But it's true. 
She's, she's great. She is a powerhouse. I mean, any man that's going to be with his woman needed to have the Holy Ghost, right? Because you've got to be built up. You've got you to keep up. I, you know, I'm supposed to be the head of the house. I'm not supposed to be trailing behind. So she's saying, okay, Lord, you know, if this guy's not, I, I don't know if this can work. And God said, you just, you just be calm, be quiet. She said, okay, okay, God, I'll shut up. She said, but on his way home tonight, you just light him up in the car. <laughs> so I'm driving home, praising God. Just had a great time with my girlfriend. Didn't know that she was mad at me. You know, just driving home. And as I'm driving through Ritchie Canyon over here, as a matter of fact, I'm turning. We were living in Moreno Valley. And, and so I'm driving over there and driving home. And, and I'm just praising the Lord. I'm just loving on God. And I'm saying, Lord, you're so faithful. Lord, you're so good. Lord, you're awesome, God. I just love you. So I'm so grateful, God. And all of a sudden I started. And I didn't even realize when I crossed over. It was just kind of, it just flowed out. And I got home and I realized, you know, partway through the canyon, well, I'm doing it. It's about time that showed up. I guess it did work. It was awesome. So I called, called her up and I said, hey, honey, you'll never guess what happened. She said, oh, really? Well, smarty pants. She knew what was up. Anyways, it's good. But that's why we pray in the spirit. Uh, it was so cool. I was, anybody like watching... Good programs on TV, not the bad stuff on TV. You guys like a little TV to relax, that sort of a thing? I'm the only one? Okay, cool. Anybody like watching a little TV? It's okay. You know, you don't have to... Listen, I know we're holy in this church, but you're in the world, but you're not of the world, okay? But you can still watch TV, all right? Just make sure you're watching what you're watching. So I like this guy, Bear Grylls. Anybody know who Bear Grylls is, right? Man versus wild. That's just... You talk about that. Now you've got every man in the room just, yes, right? <laughs> This is the title is manly. And the guy's name is Bear. I mean, come on now. You, you had, he climbed Mount Everest when he was like 25 or something like that. He's part of British Special Forces. And the dude's just yoked and ripped and jumping out there into quicksand to show you how to get out. I mean, just it's the manliest stuff. Well, he started a show um, called uh, Running Wild with Bear Grylls, right? And so he's taking celebrities out and they're doing different stuff. And so he had Dion Sanders, right? Now we're talking, right? Because now you've got British Special Forces and, and, a, and a Super Bowl champion. And I'm thinking, man, this is going to be crazy. You know, this is just going to be like nuts. Well, it was because Dion is a different type of guy. He's got the football thing. And, and he said on the show, if you put me in front of a, a, a row of linebackers, I have no fear. But the moment you put me out there in the wilderness camping, oh, my goodness, right? This was just totally different for him. So they get out in their camping and they're talking to each other and they start talking about life and, and Deion Sanders starts sharing with him. He says, you know, my, my strength, I, I, was, I was running on E basically. And he says, and, and PMS wasn't working for me. What was that? That was power, money, and sex. He said, I never did drugs, never did alcohol, never did any of that kind of stuff because I knew that would tear down my body. And, and he was very disciplined that way, but power, money, and sex tore him apart. Finally, he found himself in the midst of a nasty divorce, losing his children. And he started to get despondent of life and tried to actually kill himself. And I was just shocked because I, I never knew any of this about him. And so here he is sharing it. And, and, and Bear, who is a believer, starts to, to, to talk to him about his faith and said, but you, you, something happened. What happened to you? He says, well, I gave my heart to the Lord. And, and now I'm a Christian. And I believe God. I wanted to be the best dad. I wanted to know all their shoe sizes, all their clothing sizes, and their birthdays. And he says, and I just worked so hard to be the best dad I could be. And now I've got custody. And now things are cool and things are happening in life. And so they, so they kind of you know, shared this common bond there. And so the next day, they're, they're going up. And they're going to the place where they're going to get extracted because that was kind of it's a two-day thing they go to one place they spend the night and then they go to another place and like a helicopter picks them up or something like that right so their extraction point is at the top of the mountain now i've got a picture let's show the first picture guys up there in the back here's the first picture is bear and Dion sanders that's the mountain that they were going to climb to get extracted on okay so they climb up, they scramble up the side of that thing, and it's just loose rock and shale, right? So they go up the side, and they get to the point. Now, to climb straight up that, you cannot climb straight up a wall unless you're like Spider-Man, right? So they have to do something. They have to go around, and they found these old anchor points that the old prospectors had put on the sides of this mountain. Let's show the next picture, guys. There it is. Okay, now, I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a line running across in front of where their hands are. See, see where Dion's hand is? There's a line that runs across, very little line. That is an old line from the early 1900s. And what they were doing was they were locking in their, their harnesses on a carabiner. They were locking onto that line and then 
shimming their way up, little by little, up and holding on to that line. Now, Dion had a big problem with this. And I want to read to you some of what he said, okay? Dion had a, a big, big problem with this. And, and, and so he reaches the end of himself and he says this. He says, I'm not ready. I have to be ready inside. And he says to God, he starts to pray. He says, Lord, you didn't bring me all the way out here to end this. And then all of a sudden, he stops and he starts to pray in the Spirit. I was shocked. I'm like, this is, this is a national broadcast television program. Here's Deion Sanders sitting on a rock in the middle of a wilderness in Utah next to a mesa going, And I'm like... And then they, they, they do the cutaway, you know, to where they're talking to him. And he says... Well, the prayer language is what, you know, I talk to God and God understands that language and he starts to build me up inside when I speak. And then he went on to go and do the rest of the, of the, the trail up. He locked in, he clipped in, he went up. They, they even did a leap of faith where they jumped across this big chasm and he was praying in tongues before he jumped off. And, and, and he went one, two, three and just jumped across and made it across with bear and they scrambled the rest of the way up and he was so happy. But, but what an amazing, natural example that, that, that we all can take for our lives. You know what? In, in natural things, in, in, in business, in, in our family, my goodness, we need to humble ourselves and depend on God, and we need to wholly lean ourselves on Him in every way we can, all the way to the end of our rope until we can, and then you believe God, you trust God, you pray in the Spirit, you go after God, and believe that God is going to make up the difference where you can't. <laughs> Last one for tonight. What have we learned so far? We learn so far working with the strength of God, number one in holiness, number two in humility, and number three, number three, working with the strength of God in, number three for tonight, in happiness. Now, I put it up on the overheads in parentheses, joy, because joy is really the word, because happiness comes and goes. Happiness is dependent on circumstances, but I needed a word that started with the letter H, okay, <laughs> to just keep it, keep it consistent. So, really, it's joy, but for our purposes tonight talking about happiness. Now, I want to make a statement to you. Think about this for a second. What we love makes us happy, right? That, that's even in natural things. If you love dogs, when you see your dog when you get home, that dog's going to come bounding at you when you come in the door and be all excited and shaking the tail and jumping up and down. You'll be happy, right? If you love your family, when you come walking in the door like I do and you hear, Daddy, 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 you know, and, and there's, there's dancing and celebration and, you know, all that. I mean, you, you're happy. In the same way, if you love money, when you get your paycheck, you're happy, right? If, if you, see, what you love makes you happy. Now, if your love, listen to this, okay, because I'm taking you somewhere. If we love what is temporary, then our happiness can be lost. Hello? See, if you love money, then when money comes, you're happy. When money's gone, you're not happy. But if we love Christ, if we love Jesus, if we love the Lord, then our happiness is eternal. It goes beyond the natural, the now, the circumstances around us, and you will be happy regardless of circumstances. Let me show this to you. Last scripture for tonight, Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Okay, go back past the Psalms, past the book of Job, past the book of Esther, and you'll find Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, the people have just rebuilt the wall, they've restored worship. Now, the reading of the law, the word of God has been read to the people, and the people realize, my goodness, we have not been doing what God has called us to do. We've gone so far away from God, and the people start to weep. They're, they're repentant in their hearts. And yet, this was supposed to be a day of rejoicing, a day of celebration, a day of happiness, if you will. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 9, and Nehemiah, who was, this is not on the overheads, I'll put verse 10 up on the overheads, but Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest, and the scribe and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Verse 10, look at verse 10. This one is up on the overheads. 
Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Now, now hold on right there. Okay, because we look at that and we see all of the external circumstantial things, right? We're eating the fat, we're drinking the sweet, we got food, we got drink, we're merry. People are getting stuff when they don't have, right? There's, there's blessings being passed around. And we think about all that kind of stuff and we think, well, that's, that's a reason for celebration. That is not the reason for celebration. That's what you do in celebration because of the real reason for celebration. You want to know what it is? Last part of the verse, look at what it says. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, when you have the joy of the Lord in your heart, doesn't matter what you have, don't have, who's there, who's not there, the only one that matters if they're there or not is Jesus, right? And when you got Jesus, you've got happiness, you've got joy, because it's not based on the temporary, not based on the circumstantial, now it's based on the King Eternal, and you can have joy, you can have a smile on your face, you can have some pep in your step, why? Because Jesus is the Lord of all. And I love what they do in response. They go and they celebrate, right? Eat the fat, drink the sweet. And look at what it says. Send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. You know what that is? That's encouragement. We all need encouragement. My goodness, when you come into the house of the Lord, I know there are people who came into this place tonight looking for encouragement. I'm happy to tell you, you came to the right place because the joy of the Lord is your strength. God loves you, but, but hey, 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 I love you. And guess what? Your brothers and sisters in the room, they love you. Is that right, everybody? Yeah. See, that's, that's why we come to church. That's part of why church, too. Because we are connected to one another in Christ. We're brothers and sisters, and we all need each other. Send portions to those who do not have. See, there should have been rejoicing because the joy of the Lord is their strength. They should have been feasting, should have been celebrating. Now they could have gone home and had nothing and said, well, I guess we don't get to celebrate. But this day was holy to the Lord. And therefore, they said, encourage your brothers and sisters. Give to them who do not have. Love people and, and, and express that love in what you have. Church, we need to encourage. We need to be encouraged. And we need to have that same happiness, that joy. The joy that you have, you can give to someone. And guess what? Even though you give it away, you'll still have it. Isn't that neat? Because Jesus is the well that never runs dry. And therefore, when you give the encouragement that you've received, you yourself will be encouraged. It's such a neat thing. And so, all of us together, doing our part, working with the strength of the Lord. Number one, in holiness. Number two, in humility. Number three, in happiness. Did you guys get something in the word of the Lord today? God is good. God is good. I want to talk to you guys, and then uh, I want to do one other thing, and then we'll let you go. First of all, I want to talk to you about your eternal life. Talked about where strength comes from tonight. God is our strength. There's some great verses in the Bible that God is our strength and he is our salvation. And I want to talk to you, if you haven't yet given God all of your heart, haven't yet given God all of your life, Jesus called that being born again. He was talking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You want to enter the kingdom of heaven? There's no other way you're going to get there except that you be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, but let's talk about what being born again really means from the Bible. Being born again is not attending church. You can sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, but that does not make you a Christian. Just like you can go down to the ocean, sit in the water, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. Not going to happen. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Being born again is also not being raised in church. Sometimes people think because their parents told them they were Christians growing up, hung a cross or a St. Christopher around their neck, had them wear this religious jewelry and, and took them to religious classes, had them baptized or christened as a child, that they get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible to say your parents raised you in church, that makes you a Christian. Being born again is also not volunteering in church. Sometimes people think because they got involved, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in the church, or because people thought of them as a leader, that that made them right with God. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you volunteer in church, you get to go to heaven. Sometimes people think, well, I, I know God. I, I mean, that, that must mean that I'm a Christian, right? 
But did you know that the Bible records that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? They're not Christians. They're not born again. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scripture. And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is about what you've done with your heart. Remember, being born again is giving God all of your heart and all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church. Just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, a little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three, and then pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hands, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be embarrassed. Let's push past that tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Come on now. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you're that dumb. That's why he's trying to push you out of this right now. You tell that devil to go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell, away from God for eternity. This is a safe and friendly church, and we love you. We're excited for you. No one's criticizing or condemning you. No one's judging you. We've all done this at one point or another in one way or another in our lives. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus? Come on. Tonight is your night of salvation. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up, acknowledging your need for Jesus. I'll see it go up, count it, you put it right back down. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching it by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online. Hey, come on, if you're on campus, you can tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. Or if you're online, you can uh, raise your hand, God sees you, and then there's a button on our homepage called How to Know God, or if you're watching on your browser right now, that blue button that says Respond to God, you can click that, and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. God bless you guys. Who else today? Saying I need it. Five, six. Thank you in the family room. Seven up in the family rooms. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Seven. There's eight. Got you right there. Thank you. Eight wise people. Anybody else real quick? Need to give God all of your heart. Nine. Got you up there. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Now listen, you can't raise the hand of someone next to you. They got to raise it themselves, okay? So this has got to be your free will choice, all right? So if that's you in this place and you're saying, yeah, I need to do this for myself. I know I need to do this. Listen, you can't save yourself. We talked about where strength comes from. You don't have the strength to save yourself. Can't get out. You got to reach out to the Lord. and He will save you. Got to believe on Jesus for your salvation. Went to the cross. Thank you. Anybody else? Nine wise people. Anybody else real quick? God loves you so much. He's just waiting for you. If you feel the Lord tugging at your heart right now, just respond to him. Somebody raise up that hand. Is there anybody else? Don't you just know there's number 10. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, yeah, you should. Go for it. Go for it. Come on, just lift your hand up if that's you. You were just sitting there wondering, I wonder if I should do this. Yeah, God just spoke to you. Come on, just lift up your hand right now. Anybody else? Come on, number 10, just lift it up. Where are you at, number 10? Come on, just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on now. Go for it. Don't be shy. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. If that's you, just lift it up. One more sweep through, and then I'm going to close this up. I don't want you to miss this. That's why I'm taking some time with you. It's okay. Come on, when I'm looking in your direction, just pop it up. Anybody else? Anybody else in this section? Come on, number 10. If that's you, just pop it up. Anybody else over here? Anybody else on this side? 
All right, well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for nine wise people. Hallelujah. Now, all nine of you that raised your hand, or number 10, you rascal, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout. As we do that, that's your cue. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies tonight. So grab your purse, your Bible. Grab a friend if you need a friend. Let's all stand and welcome them. No one leaves during this time. You let them come. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. If that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on down to the front. From the family rooms, you can bring your children. They'll remember this. Come on down right now. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that come on, come on, I come on. live. You're the reason that I breathe. They're still coming. Jesus, come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. In you. Jesus, I belong. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. You can come too. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that They're still coming. I breathe. We'll wait for you. Come on down. Come Jesus, on down right now. I believe. Anybody else if you need to come? Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe. All right, they're coming. Anybody else? Just make your way to the front right now. Slip in the aisle. Jesus, Come on down. I believe. All right, you guys. Everybody up front, put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you? This is Dr. Becker. Okay, if you can't remember Dr. Becker, Dr. B, right? He's a cool guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance so you're not wondering or concerned or afraid, Okay. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. That's awesome. Brand new on the inside, okay? Jesus is coming in, going to make you a whole new person, okay? That old person, gone, okay? Brand new person in Jesus. Now, how do you live as a Christian? Well, the second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff. A couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do? Well, this little booklet will help you to find out what to do next. Thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program we have here that we call Spiritual Personal Trainers. What is that? It's a friend in church. You heard of a physical trainer helps you at the gym, get strong, that sort of a thing. Spiritual Personal Trainer will do that for you spiritually. It's a friend in church. They'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back to the old way, but you go on with God's way, God's strength, right? Okay, we all need a friend to encourage us. We talked about encouragement tonight. We all need someone to encourage us because otherwise we'll get discouraged and we'll go back and do the stuff that we thought worked but really wasn't working. That's why you're here tonight, okay? So it's easy, it's free, and you need to do that. And finally, Dr. Becker, I want you just to pray a simple prayer. He's gonna pray a simple prayer. We talked about praying in, in the Holy Spirit, right? That, that's a, probably a new concept for some of you guys. He's gonna just pray that you guys are baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight, okay? And, and as you do, maybe you're like me. Maybe nothing's going to happen. Maybe you'll get a word in your thinking. M maybe you'll have a whole prayer language coming on out, okay? Now, that may seem strange or weird, but let me tell you something. Once you understand from the Word of God what that is, it's the most natural, most amazing thing. And just like I used it tonight decently and in order, it's not crazy weirdo stuff, right? We talked about that. You're born again, you're brand new, and He's going to pray that prayer for you, and He's going to believe, God, that you're going to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be baptized in a new baptism, baptized in love, baptized in, in, in just an amazing power of God to be a witness and a testimony for Jesus. With that, comes this wonderful gift of a language that you could pray to God. And he'll describe that a bit, and then he'll let you guys come right back out, okay? Not going to mess with you, not going to beat you up or anything weird like that, okay? You'll, you'll be able to come right back out. Your friends will wait for you, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Dr. Becker right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. 
and then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.